Um, so before I start, raise your hand if you ever heard the name Cloudify, Gigaspaces. All right, <laughs> good stuff. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to start first with the motivation behind Cloudify, kind of using a funny uh, story here. Okay, so we're talking about a company, a fictional company, obviously, called Petsy. Um, and they've been selling pet art since uh, last year. And you can see some of their finest specimens over here. Um, and Petsy has a pretty complex uh, deployment stack. They have um, Nginx on the front, uh, Python Unicorn web server, backing it, ActiveMQ, Mongo, Hadoop, to do some, num some uh, data crunching. Um, and then here on the right side, they have a bunch of uh, monitoring and, and admin tools like uh, Logstash, Graphite, Nagios. Um, and, you know, the business is doing quite well. They're selling, everyone loves pet art, especially the stuff the cat, cats are making uh, from toilet peppers. Um, but they have a few issues around rolling and deploying new code. So the first thing that they actually experience is that um, every time they want to push a new version, they have to do it manually. Um, it's not really something that they do easily. Um, they have to take down their servers. They have to uh, install the new code in each and every server and start it. And if everything breaks, they have to roll everything back manually. So it's really, really error prone. Um, and then <clears throat> when something really breaks uh, in production, they find it very hard to fix things. It takes them a lot of time, typically a few days. Um, so they figure that they need to automate, um, and automation is key. Okay, so you probably know the famous meme about automation. It's it's their take about on it. Again, uh, given their love for cats, um, so they started looking at all the processes they need to support uh, to deploy their application, and they soon realized that, realized that it's really about what we call workflows and triggers. Okay, so a workflow is really something that you would do to uh, support one of the steps in your application's life cycles. And a trigger is something that triggers the workflow. Okay? So for example, installation can be triggered manually by a developer or by an operator. Uh, and the workflow is really the installation workflow that I'm going to talk about in a second. Uh, or for example, um, scaling is something that can be triggered based on specific metrics um, and thresholds that are being crossed. And then it will be followed by a scaling workflow that would create the VMs, install the right stuff on them, join them uh, um, make them join the cluster, and so on. Um, so then they started to identify all the processes they need to support. Um, the first one was automated deployment. Um, and then they started to analyze that and try to figure out, uh, first of all, what would trigger that, and then second, what is involved in, in this workflow. So the trigger, like I said, is manual, for example. If, if uh, you know that you have a new version to deploy or you want to set up a new environment for testing, for production, um, or what have you, um, you can do it manually. Uh, but then it can also be triggered from a CI server like Jenkins or Travis. If you build your code, you want to set up new environments. Um, and in fact, um, many people actually use that as, their tri as a trigger for, for their deployments. And if you look at what the workflow needs to do um, during this step, it's not just about pushing the code to a new server. It's all about setting up the environment. So if you're using CloudStack, it's about provisioning the resources and resources don't just mean compute servers. It, it actually also means storage, like block storage devices you want to allocate or attach to your, your VMs. Network interfaces, a lot of, uh, a lot of their deployments, uh, for example, right now they have uh, a DMZ, an internal network, with the use for the web servers, and then another network for the database. So provisioning an envir environment would mean to create all of those networks, create routers between them, attach the right VMs to the networks. Um, and that's just the first phase of creating the infrastructure. The second phase of this flow is to configure the servers, uh, typically using uh, shell scripts, you know, which most people use, uh, but also uh, tools like Chef or Puppet, and more recently Ansible or, or, or Salt. And um, essentially taking a VM and configuring it properly. Once that is done, um, making sure to push the right code onto it and basically start the components. And this is also something that you need to orchestrate because, for example, sometimes you just can't, st can't start the web server before you start the database. It needs to know about its location, and port, number, and all these things. Um, if you also take into consideration all of the kind of accompanying components, the monitoring components, and the log aggregation components, these are also things that you need to wire uh, into this whole thing. So it becomes a really complex process to orchestrate and set up. The next workflow they identified is infrastructure upgrade. Um, so 
This doesn't typically happen very, very often, but every once in a while you need to patch your OS. And you know, we all heard about the, uh, the OpenSSL stuff yesterday. Uh, so this is the kind of event that makes you actually um, patch your OS. It can also happen with your middleware, your databases, your web servers, and so on. Um, and when that happens, um, you uh, usually would want to do that gradually so you don't take down the entire system. So that would involve maybe taking down the relevant VMs or processes one by one, apply the patch, and reconnect them to the cluster. Again, it's, it's a workflow that you need to, uh, to be able to do. And at every point in this workflow, you need to actually check that things are working correctly. And if, they're, if they don't, you, you want to be able to roll them back. Next phase is code push. Um, so code push is a bit different than uh, infrastructure upgrade. That typically happens much more often. Um, that's one thing that's different. The other thing that's different is that we usually, um, in terms of the degree of uh, confidence that we have in our code is much lower than the degree of confidence that we have in patches or um, OS upgrades because they tend to change a lot more often and are less tested uh, by, by, uh, by many people. Um, so again, if, we, if you're doing continuous uh, deployment, that would be the CI server that would do it automatically. If we're just doing continuous delivery, uh, that would be done manually after we uh, verified everything is working. Uh, but that too can be quite a complex workflow. Uh, so for example, um, Canary instance is one of the ways you can do that, right? So uh, you can assign a certain instance that we call a Canary instance, deploy the new code to it, verify that everything is working correctly. Um, and then if that is, if that is okay, push it to the rest of the nodes. If it's not okay, roll it back. Um, there are red, black, or uh, blue, green deployment. It's kind of a synonymous, uh, and which is essentially, when you're using a cloud, you can do it. You can, actually, you can actually set up a whole new environment side by side with the existing one, make some basic validations on top of that. If everything goes well, route the traffic to it, keep the other one in place for a couple of hours, couple of days, just to make sure things are running correctly. And when it, you're sure that everything is okay, take it down. Um, so these are just some of the strategies that, that, that you need to, uh, to be able to handle. And again, it's all a very, very complex workflow that you need to uh, uh, go through, and you need to be able to roll it back at any point in time. Okay, so it's not just enough to do it manually. The next piece of workflow is, is node failure, and you know, trigger is that these things uh, tend to happen, especially if you have a large deployment. Um, and what you need to do here is first detect that. Okay, again, typically using your monitoring systems. Um, provision new resources instead of the ones that failed. Attaching the storage to them, attaching the networks. Reconfiguring your application. Um, or for example, if you're using a load balancer and your web server has failed, when the web server starts again, you need to reattach it to the load balancer so it's available to your users. Um, if a database fails, for example, a MySQL a master fails, you fail over to the, sec to the secondary node, you need to notify all the related components uh, about uh, this, this new master uh, so that the application keeps functioning correctly. Um, and the last bit of workflow is scaling. Um, so scaling is kind of the advancement, uh, advanced thing. You, got, you mentioned it uh, as, as, as what you guys are doing next. Um, um, so this is kind of the next phase in uh, what you want to do around automation. Uh, typically what you would do, you'd measure uh, what we call SLAs, service level agreements. Uh, these can be simple ones like CPU or memory or disk utilization. They can be more application-centric uh, metrics or KPIs uh, like the number of concurrent sessions that you have on your web server or the number of uh, locks or connections that you have to your database. And then um, as you identify those, those metrics and breach some of the thresholds that you defined, you want to be able to start new instances or to scale your application. Um, what that involved is also typically quite complex because it's not just enough to uh, add, for example, you have a web server. It's not just enough to add new nodes to the web server and uh, install, I don't know, uh, uh, Node.js on top of them. Uh, you need to, again, reconfigure the load balancer. It's kind of similar to failure. You need to reconfigure the load balancer. Um, you need to push the right version of the code to those servers. Uh, you need to identify, to actually notify dependent nodes. For example, if you're scaling, a MongoDB instance, adding shards, or a Cassandra instance. Uh, you want, typically you want the clients that use those uh, services to know about the, the changes. Okay, so bottom line, we have a very complex set of triggers and workflows that we need to automate. Um, one thing to note here is that almost in every one of those workflows, 
it just it wasn't it just wasn't enough to uh, touch one of the tiers, right? So I have typically I have three tiers or three layers in every everything that I do. I have the application layer, which is my code or my uh, uh, my schema for the database. I have my middleware layer or the platform layer where I install the services like uh, like the database and the, uh, and the web server, and I have the infrastructure layer, which is kind of a, in our case it's cloud stack. And every one of those workflows, if you recall, had to touch and had to manipulate all of these tiers together, right? So it's not enough. Usually when people think about, for example, um, DevOps, you know, they tend to think about Chef and Pop and configuring servers, but what about the application on top of it? What about the code pushes? Uh, when people think about operations, they tend to think about this layer or even below that, right, the physical infrastructure. But what about, the, uh, what about these things? So everything that you do need to uh, involve and encompass all of those layers. Um, okay, so um, basically, let's let's now look at a bit of the tools. If we look at the you know the, all the concerns that I, sh I just mentioned, put them on kind of this continuum. Uh, we have environment creation, infrastructure and setup, code pushes, monitoring and alarming, repairing and scaling, and let's look at some tools that do at least some of these things. Um, so when it comes to orchestration tools. Um, I know a few in other clouds, like Heat, if you guys, if anyone here familiar with Heat from, Heat from OpenStack? Okay, Sebastian, anything similar that we have for CloudStack still, or? Next talk. Okay, excellent, excellent. Um, and uh, CloudFormation, which I, I assume most of you guys know from AWS, uh, what these are very good at is uh, essentially having a blueprint for all the infrastructure that you would need for a specific application or a specific deployment. Um, so it's very good at creating your environment, networks, VMs, um, block storage devices, load balancer configuration, and so on. Um, they can trigger tools like Chef or Puppet or Bash Scripts, um, but you know it doesn't feel that natural, and, and it's not really the best way to do that. Um, just one comment about all these tools. You'd probably be able to do most of this stuff with each one of these tools. You just have to work very hard to do that. Um, then we have CM tools. Um, we're kind of in a very interesting times today, you know. Uh, we used to have just Puppet and Chef, and we have a lot more uh, new players uh, in the stack. We have Salt, we have Ansible, uh, we have Juju from Ubuntu, and I'm, I'm sure I'm kind of missing a few more here. Um, I don't know, uh, CF Engine also, sorry, you know, from C Engine, CF Engine here, I didn't mention that. Uh, so there are a lot of tools uh, that uh, typically do kind of the same thing. Um, Basically, here is a server, here's a node. This is where it is now, this is where I want it to be, and basically these tools can do the magic under the hood to, uh, to be able to bring it from one state to another. Um, so they're very good at this, basically configuring the environment and, and installing packages and so on. Um, some of them can do this and automate it, although it's not their primary target. So for example, Ansible has some very nice packages around Amazon, um, but it's not their primary concern. Um, you can, and I know a lot of companies that actually implement code pushes with Chef, for example, uh, but again, you have to kind of do a lot of, a lot of work um, around it to be able to support that, you know, um, because Chef wasn't really designed for that. It's not push-based, it's actually pull-based, so you have, the, you have to have the Chef client wake up every once in a while, look at some state, understand that it's changed, pull the code, and so on. Um, and some of them can do repairing at a very basic level. Uh, so for example, again, Chef or Puppet, if you run them every once in a while, um, and they identify that something is not as it should be, for example, a certain process is not uh, up and running, they would start it for you. They would not be able to do repairing uh, of anything beyond the VM scope or the host scope. If, if an entire VM fails, it's not the right tool to, uh, to handle that. Um, some other automation tools that are, again, very good at, I, I actually put Salt and Ansible here as well because they go a bit beyond uh, just the configuration manager. They're actually push-based, so you can actually do some orchestration with them. Um, again, they're very good at, at infrastructure setup. Uh, it's very easy to implement code pushes with them as well. Um, Fabric, Capistrano, anyone using them here? All right, Ever, anyone know? Do you guys know Fabric or, okay. Um, yeah, so these are, Basically, kind of a remote, distributed remote execution framework that you can execute actually commands uh, with them very easily. Um, and of course, monitoring, right? So um, a lot of tools there. I just 
put in some that we use, right? Uh, Re uh, Zabbix, Xenos, uh, Graphite, Nagios, of course. I guess most of you guys uh, have used it sometime in the past. Uh, I also put Logstash here because a lot of our users actually use Logstash not just as a log aggregation framework, but also as a monitoring framework. Um, one of the interesting thing, things you can do with logging, and I'll actually, I hope to show it during the demo, is you can aggregate, you can make your applications emit structured log messages and take these messages and aggregate them and collect them and understand things about your business. So for example, every time a user logs into the system, there's a very specific log message that gets submitted. This tool can actually aggregate that, push it, for example, to Elasticsearch, and then you can actually uh, understand, for example, the, uh, uh, the behavior over time of this specific event. So you have a business metric uh, which you can act upon. Uh, so it's not just about logging, it's actually about collecting metrics that you cannot collect in any other way. Um, Riemann is actually another interesting tool. Um, and um, I'm going to talk about that as well, uh, or I'm going to show it as well in the demo. So Riemann, anyone heard about it? You guys, yeah, the guys from Switzerland. <laughs> um, and so Riemann is a, I would say, um, how would you best define it? Like an event aggregation framework that lets you create an enclosure. It lets you define rules, kind of rules, to process monitoring events and to make sense of them. So for example, uh, group together s certain events for a specific window of time, then send them over to another uh, uh, pipe uh, um, place in your input, uh, send alerts based on that, feed metrics into Graphite, uh, do a bunch of other interesting things. Uh, so that's another tool that we're pretty excited about. Just, that's why I put it here. Anyway, so the bottom line here is that we have all these tools, and each one of them does one thing very, very well, specifically, maybe some other things not as well. Um, and when you want to kind of cater for all of the workflows and requirements that I've uh, talked about before, you'd have to do a lot of hard manual work, okay? So if you want to be here where everything is working nice and, and, and you know, uh, all of your uh, phases here are covered with nice smileys, um, you'd have to do a lot of kind of uh, um, gluing work, or write a lot of glue code to be able to handle that. Um, so. I'm going to take a step back and look, look at, for example, AWS. Um, so with AWS, um, if we look at their tool chain, uh, we mentioned CloudFormation, which is kind of here, around orchestration, infrastructure orchestration. We have, of course, the basic APIs, which you can use uh, without using any, any orchestration tool. Uh, just write code yourself. And then we have kind of the higher level services, right? So we have Beanstalk here, which is, which is kind of, they don't call it that way, but it's really a proper platform as a service, uh, very similar to Cloud Foundry or OpenShift. And there's the new kid in the block, which is AWS OpsWorks, relatively new. Um, it's already a year old or even more. Um, and I would say OpsWorks is kind of the closest thing that we have to basically uh, providing all this glue around those, those tools. Um, so, CTO, I'm, uh, Werner Vogel uh, calls it DevOps automation. He's a CTO of, of Amazon. Um, and the idea is very simple. You define stacks. So stacks is basically uh, um, the way your application is structured. So if you remember the, uh, the, the, the picture or the diagram from the beginning of the talk where you have all these boxes and all these uh, uh, tools, you actually model them as a stack and identify how they interconnect with one another. And then <clears throat> basically within, uh, within the stack, you have those layers, which are basically your web server, your database. And for each layer, define how you want to install it. Uh, typically, LBS, um, sorry, uh, OpsWorks supports Chef for that. Um, how many instances you want off of it, whether or not you want some metrics to go into uh, CloudWatch to be able to monitor th this stuff. So it's, it's a very similar concept to what I just described. Um, tailor-made to the Amazon or AWS tool chain. The thing with that is also it's a bit, it's a bit too rigid. Um, it has a very specific uh, life cycle. It has very specific workflows. You can typically kind of deal with them. So if you want to tweak the workflow, for example, if you have a continuous uh, deployment workflow um, and you want to tweak it, you cannot do it here. Uh, if you want to um, tweak the way they recover from failure and stuff like that, it's not really something you can control. It's kind of built into the platform. It's hard-coded. So the idea behind Cloudify is, um, again, um, take this, these concepts and basically build a tool that will integrate 
um, the tool chain that you're using, whether it's Chef or Puppet or Salt, um, the cloud that you want to have, okay? So Cloud Stack, we are natively integrated with Cloud Stack um, for both, I'm gonna talk about the versions later, but uh, we've done some work around that for uh, both our existing and our future version with the help, with the kind help of Sebastian, uh, and, and I'm gonna talk about that as well, uh, using LibCloud and, and JClouds for the other version. Um, so, the, the idea behind that is to have it as open as possible. Okay, an open source platform, obviously. It's, it's unlicensed under Apache 2. Um, being able to define custom workflows. Have a few workflows out of the box, of course, but being able to define custom workflows and custom triggers for those workflows. Um, not just limited to Chef, of course, because as you mentioned, as you rightly mentioned, uh, Chef might be maybe, I don't know, 5%, or if you're, if you're kind of optimistic here from the whole kind of automation market. Um, and have open monitoring and policies, right? So if I'm, if I'm using Zabbix, I want to be able to uh, attach that. If I'm using uh, an Agios, maybe that's the thing I want to use. If I'm using StatsD, I want to connect that. And I want to be able to define my policies based on that. Okay, so that's, that's for example, what we use Riemann for. So you can use Riemann to actually define those policies for your tools. Um, before I jump to the demo, um, the, the basic um, idea is to have um, an application blueprint, uh, kind of like a stack uh, if you will, with OpsWorks. And the blueprint is uh, divided into three parts. The first part is the topology, describing the components and the relationship between the components. Uh, for example, two web server, two Tomcats, or two Node.js instances connected to uh, uh, one Mongo S instance, which is connected to two Mongo D instances. And that's how they depend on one another. Uh, and that's a topology. And the topology is not just about your uh, application components, it's about everything that's related to your application. So it's about the VMs, about the networks, about uh, the routers uh, that, that connect them, about the storage medium, um, and again, and, and then later, the application components and modules on top of them. This is, this is a complete topology. Um, then there are workflows. Actually, maybe I can show what a topology looks like before the demo. Uh, so this is a topology, right, for example, um, and we're going to see it uh, in a live demo in a second. Uh, so we have here, for example, the tier, and then within the tier we have hosts, within the hosts we have servers or middleware, and within the, within the servers we have uh, um, modules, which connect to another host, again, which has another module within it, and that's, that's how it's all layered. Um, Again, you have networks, and you have uh, storage mediums, uh, so it's all part of your topology. Let's go back here. Um, how am I doing on time, by the way? Five minutes, all right, okay, so we should just jump to the demo. Uh, so we have workflows, which describe the workflows that I men just mentioned, and policies that actually control how you trigger those workflows. And the workflows basically manipulate the topology, if you will, all right? So a workflow would uh, add instances to topology, remove instances from topology, and so on. Uh, so the demo I'm gonna show now is um, actually the next re release of our platform. Um, so we're basically using Exascale, uh, which is probably the best and most reliable cloud stack, public cloud that I know. Uh, what we've done is we've instantiated a management server uh, on one of the Exascale servers, um, and then we've used, um, let me see where I am here. Yeah. And then we've used, uh, we have a blueprint here. Okay, so we took a blueprint. This is the blueprint, and let me show it to you. Kind of simple over here. Okay, so it's kind of just a YAML file. I'm not gonna get into the details, but just to, so you see how easy it is, you define um, the n name of the blueprint and the tiers that compose it, right? So we have a VM that hosts Mongo, we have a VM that hosts Node, and on top of the Mongo VM, we have the MongoD instance, and on top of the Node VM, we have the Node.js instance, and within the Node.js, we have an application. Uh, it's, a, it's a demo Node.js application called Node Seller. Um, if you want to learn Express and Node and Bootstrap and all that stuff, it's kind of nice. Um, so we took this blueprint, we uploaded it to the server using this command, and we basically see it over here. Okay, so this is my blueprint. It kind of describes the topology. It's much simpler than the one I showed you in the slide, okay, because, you know, for the sake of uh, simplicity. Um, so we have a VM, 
the Node.js within it. These are the instances, the app module, and this is actually dependent on the MongoD, which is hosted inside the MongoD VM. Okay, very simple topology. Obviously, it can get much more complex with networks and, and routes and all that stuff. Um, the next thing we do is we um, actually, where is it? Over here. Uh, we create a deployment off of that topology. And a deployment basically is, think of it as an instantiation of is there a tweet? <laughs> Instantiation of the topology. Um, and for each such deployment, we can actually start triggering workflows manually. Okay, so in this case, we have two simple workflows, install and uninstall, which basically traverse the topology um, and materialize it. Okay, the materialization of the topology is done um, very in a very high level through uh, Python agents that receive tasks over a message queue um, and invoke what we call plugins. Plugins are basically uh, pieces of code, pieces of Python code, uh, or bash code, or chef code that do specific uh, uh, operations. So for example, we have now, uh, in this demo, we have a Python agent that invokes libcloud to create all of the instances on, uh, on, on CloudStack. Um, then on top of that, we have a bash script that fetches MongoDB from the internet, unpacks and installs it in the local machine. And once we invoke this uh, topology, we basically have it materialized here. Uh, so we see that everything is kind of running in green, one out of one. Uh, we also have very nice uh, log aggregation and task aggregation framework here. Uh, this is actually based on Elasticsearch. So part of the platform is actually deploying log stash on each of those boxes and pushing the events into Elasticsearch. Um, and then basically being able to visualize and, and trace those events. Uh, there's a more detailed view for that. Let me just filter it out here, and it's fetching that. Crossing my fingers, yeah. All right, um, so these are the events, right? So I can see also, I, I can see proper tasks that were sent, and I can also see uh, logging events. Uh, so for example, here we can see a task that, um, an install task that's, uh, that installs the Node.js the Node VM, and here I can see that it succeeded. So I have very good tracing about what's going on in the platform. Obviously, I can also see tr and trace those events uh, from the CLI. Let me just show you guys. Yeah. Okay, so I can fetch the events. Oops. This is probably the wrong deployment. Anyway, I can fetch the events using the CLI in verbose or just simple format. Um, as we move forward, obviously, what we can do is we can add more workflows for scaling, for uh, continuous delivery, uh, and so on. That's part of the things we're planning to do with the platform. So I'm just gonna end with uh, one thing here. Um, the platform itself is uh, just available on uh, getcloudify.org. Uh, the, the, the version that I show now is in beta. Okay, it's all available, of course, on GitHub. Uh, some of the pieces here are, uh, uh, most of the pieces here are open source. Uh, there will be some commercial uh, features, obviously, because we need to make money off of something. Um, and again, we, we encourage you guys to give it a try, uh, download, See for yourself, it's very easy to, to install and set up. That's it. No time for questions, right? Or? Yeah, we got we time for questions. Excellent. Okay. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. So, one, one thing you can do, well, actually, we've done it for one of our users and we're going to open source it very soon. So, one of the plugins that you can have as part of, the topology is very flexible, so you can define any kind of type within the topology and put it in your blueprint, so you can have a Docker container type, and then it's just see another box uh, within the VM and put your stuff on top of that. So definitely it's something that some of our users have already done. More questions? Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> I have one, you mentioned that you have Elasticsearch in there and then Reman and so on. Yeah. I mean, so doesn't that make it difficult to deploy Cloudify if you have lots of so packages that come so with it? So deployment is very simple. Deployment is just a matter of, actually, if you, I, I probably have that command in my history. Um, that's what the deployment is like. It's one command. We've actually packaged everything into a self-sustained package. No external dependencies. What this does is basically start the VM on CloudStack, fetches the package from the internet, unpacks it, and you're done. 
user how to manage their own version that would be your favorite. So at th this point, user would a user would manage its his deployments on on Git repository, for example, and version version it through there. Um, one of the next thing we're going to do is actually integrate with Git, so you can actually take deployments from a specific version or branch or or, or so tag. It's already a deployed from, uh, mm -hmm. from one of the blueprints, and I'm making modification to the blueprint to the existing one. Do you do you? Yeah, you can you can actually update the blueprint. Okay, okay so you can you can up, up, update the blueprint command. Um, some of the th if you already have a deployment that's running for that blueprint. Okay. You would you you'd be able to update some of the things, not all of them. Okay. Uh, but essentially, what we can support, we can uh, we, we actually allow it to do that. Cool. Thanks again, Yuri. Thanks. Thank you, guys.